Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Monday, April 28th, 2025, and today we're going to talk about nematode control, what no-till means for crops that require digging, like potatoes, and the bees are dying at an alarming rate again. So let's do it. All right. Well, uh, happy Monday, everyone. I hope you all had a nice weekend. I did. On Friday, I actually took most of the day to go on a field trip with my kiddos school down to Fort Herod, which is the uh, first colonist uh, settlement in Kentucky in 1774. Although what is standing now is like a replica that they built. They kind of rebuilt it in the 1920s. And uh, setting aside my general feelings about colonialism, it was fascinating to see the ingenuity involved and how they produced food and clothing making fiber out of flax and stinging nettle and running a blacksmithing operation, all the things, very interesting stuff. I would have liked to hear a lot more from the indigenous perspective, but the guides were nice, thoughtful folks. I've always said that I, I could see myself working in a national park as a retirement gig one day. Uh, it sounds like a blast. Seems like a good group of nerdy uh, individuals who always occupy those roles. So I could see myself doing that. Saturday and Sunday were a lot of soccer. And Hannah and I went to Louisville to visit our friend Andy's new restaurant called M. Peppers or Monsieur Peppers, which was amazing. Then went to the Lou City FC game that night, which was also amazing with our friends Brian and Jana. So shouts to that. So all together, relaxing and busy all at the same time. Now this week, it's back to work because the gardens are about to explode. So yeah, uh, anyway, changing gears a little bit. One thing that has been on my mind to talk about uh, on the show is that there has been another nationwide collapse of honeybee populations over the last year that is researchers both puzzled and concerned. Basically, at least one recent study showed that around 1.7 million hives have been lost between June 2024 and February 2025, with many commercial beekeepers reporting losses on an average of 62% of their colonies. The survey conducted by a nonprofit group called Project Apis M, gathered uh, data from 842 beekeepers who account for around 72% of the bees in the country. So not exactly a small sample size, uh, but also it's just not the, the solely the big guys that they recorded. According to that report, hobbyist beekeepers with one to 49 colonies uh, lost an average of 51% of their colonies. Uh, sideliner operations think people with a side hustle of beekeeping and average between like 50 and 500 colonies, lost an average of 54% of their colonies. And commercial beekeepers, so more than 500 colonies, lost an average of 62% of their colonies. A reversal, says the survey, of quote, typical trends where commercial beekeepers generally experience lower losses due to their scale, resources, and skilled management practices, end quote, which I thought was kind of interesting. So the trend is higher in bees that are moved around, but not non-existent with bees that are just kept by hobbyists. But what's going on here? Well, uh, no one really knows for certain yet. There are a lot of groups analyzing honey and bees and comb for clues, but right now uh, the prime suspects are things like varroa mites, which are tiny mites that infect bee colonies. So that's one. Also pesticides uh, use and in particular fungicide residues that have been shown to have long-term effects on bees. So that's not great. And then potentially changes in weather patterns that may affect pollination timing and forage. Uh, plus when a lot of these colonies are migrating across the nation, so too are diseases. So that may as play a factor as well. Of course, it's also possible that things like varroa mites are not a cause of this collapse as much as a symptom perhaps of weakened immune systems from exposure to chemicals, specifically neonicotinoids, as some research has suggested basically that exposure uh, to these pesticides makes honeybees more susceptible to the mites. Find links to all of that stuff, of course, in the show notes if you're interested. Obviously, to the beekeepers, this will have a devastating economic effect, and no doubt huge percentages of our agriculture rely on these bees for pollination from sunflowers to almonds to canola, blueberries, melons, apples, grapes, citrus, uh, and many, many more things. So uh, yield losses could be rough in the coming year. Uh, estimates for losses from this most recent and ongoing collapse are over half a billion dollars right now. Uh, it is, of course, uh, harder to estimate the loss of native bee populations, but recent research has found significant declines in their populations as well, with declines in the 43% range in areas with high pesticide use. According to a study published in the journal Nature Sustainability, a lot is still unknown, but we do know that pesticides are 
uh, a likely culprit. And I've said this a thousand times and we'll say it a thousand more times if need be. But farming with sprays intended to kill something generally also kills other things, which kills other things, which kills other things. It's a cascade effect. Farming with death effectively spreads death. Conversely, farming with life spreads life. So uh, no doubt there is a lot wrong with a system that requires people to ship in bees across the country to ensure pollination. But at some point, we are going to have to put ferocious energy into convincing large-scale ag to turn away from pesticide usage and encourage more good guy habitat. Uh, it is hard to make the argument that organic agriculture would result in substantially lower yields when obviously so too, at least eventually, and in much more uh, dramatic ways, does conventional agriculture, quantifiably so. And that means for everyone especially if pollination dives like that. Anyway, I thought I would open up this one for discussion to hear your all's thoughts because I know I have some passionate beekeepers and the like who follow us, as well as those like myself who love them some native pollinators but can't keep honeybees because of a mild allergy where I swell up pretty good upon the stings. Otherwise, we're going to take a quick break and when we come back, we'll talk about nematodes. It's going to be a very nerdy day today. BRB. Today's episode is brought to you by Farmhand. I started a CSA to grow food and build community, not to drown in admin work. Spreadsheets, emails, and pack lists take up too much time. If I could spend less time at my desk and more in the field, that'd be a win. Enter Farmhand. Farmhand automates billing, newsletters, websites, and member support, saving CSA farmers 20 plus hours a week. Focus on farming, not paperwork. See how Farmhand can help. Book a one-on-one -on -one demo with founder Ari at farmhand.partners slash no-till. That's farmhand.partners slash no-till. All right, back to the show. If you, the listener, are enjoying this content, getting even a small amount of value from it, consider supporting our work over at patreon.com slash no-till growers. I will try to get to questions from everywhere that questions come in, but I will always get to your Patreon questions. Now, today's Patreon question comes from Patreon member Mark Hare, who writes, quote, Hey, Jesse, I have become addicted to your daily show. More than once I have listened to it while I make breakfast for my family, and then I go to work and apply something that I learned. So, wow. I coordinate a community garden in the central plateau of Costa Rica outside of downtown San Jose, but still very much urban. I have a lot of questions. I'll start with the big one. We are dealing with several pathogenic nematodes. The easy one to identify is the root knot nematode. We are using several different control methods. The line of defense we've been using for the longest is marigolds. Until recently, we weren't sure whether leaving the roots in was better or not. For control, but some articles we found last year make that a solid win. So we are interplanting with marigolds, finishing the crop and leaving the marigolds as a cover crop. Or we also just use them, the marigolds, as a cover crop. We also use products we buy from Biofabrica of Costa Rica University, including one that contains the fungus P. lilicanus. Uh, do you have any experience using these sorts of biological controls? What do you think about them? Also, we recently grew a good crop of broccoli and cabbage, and there also is some good evidence that digging in the residues of chopped cabbage releases a gas as it rots that also controls these nematodes. Can you find out or do you believe that a plant gas that destroys root knot nematodes would also be detrimental to all the good microbial life that we have built up in our soils? Trap crops is also a technique that apparently is used for the root knot nematodes. I kind of hate the trap crop concept because it seems like it eliminates all the good along with the bad. Am I being too dogmatic? I have so many other questions. You are really going to regret, I think, encouraging us to pile them on. But thank you for anything you can offer. P.S. I realize that you are in clay soils. Nematodes are probably not a problem. So thanks for answering as best you can and for digesting any of the research available. End quote. Okay, so a uh, lot to tackle there, Mark, but I have no problem with you piling on the questions. I do one of these every day, so all good. And I have summarized the, your question a little bit here, uh, but let's just take it a little bit by bit. So as you suggested, Mark, I don't have direct experience with root knot nematodes because here, here in Clay Ridge, Kentucky, they're not super common, but it's something I've looked into before uh, for others for just how incredibly prolific and harmful this particular pest can be to agriculture. Sandy warm soils in the tropics is definitely prime for not only the four main and more harmful harmful types of root knot nematodes, but for many of the 90-ish known species. So like you alluded to, you are likely dealing with several types of nematodes, uh, good and bad. So in terms of plants and like marigolds, but also various uh, chrysanthemums and calendula, etc., that are linked to nematode suppression, are linked most commonly when incorporated into the soil versus when they are growing. This is a blanket statement, of course, but uh, many of them are resistant to suppressant nematodes, but not necessarily for other plants around them 
until their foliage and roots are incorporated. Does that make sense? Uh, there are actually quite a few of these sorts of crops like peonies, uh, some legumes, cinnamon, and others that have been linked to nematode suppression. But again, the suppression seems to be linked most heavily when the foliage and roots are actually incorporated into the soil. In fact, even plants that don't have any obvious nematicidal uh, biochemicals produced like in their plants while growing can produce some of those chemicals in degradation, like the broccoli you mentioned, but brassicas in general are good for this. To your questions about that, I'm less concerned with the negative soil life effects of biofumigation, for instance, growing a mustard crop uh, and tilling it into the soil to suppress nematodes and or pathogenic fungi or whatever it is. Uh, because although, yes, it is incorporating some biofumigation chemicals into the soil, it can increase the microbial diversity in the soil, which effectively crowds out the nematodes as opposed to uh, just straight killing everything or killing them. Uh, what a lot of the research seems to point to, often directly, is that higher soil organic matter, a soil property that tends to be lower in sandy tropical soils, is often directly correlated with pathogenic nematode populations. So indeed, incorporating cover crops, crop residue, manure, slash compost, these will have a positive effect on the soil's ability to suppress these punks because it will have a positive effect on the soil's organic matter content, microbial diversity, and so on. I'll post a few links in the show notes, but it sounds uh, to me like you are doing all the things right that you need to do. I would just maybe consider doubling down on practices that increase soil organic matter, like cover cropping, uh, but add some more diversity in there as well. And maybe just focus more on those things that do great things for soil. Uh, make some good compost as well and involve those in your practices. And as for the P. liliconis uh, question, I don't necessarily have any issue with this, I guess. But I will say that that particular fungi is also considered a human pathogen. So although the risk is low with a commercial product like that, just follow the application directions uh, really, really well. On the trap crops part of the question, there are uh, ways to use trap crops effectively, but by and large, I would focus on the soil health first and only use those if all else fails. Anyway, I hope that was helpful and I appreciate the challenging, uh, but also very interesting questions. All right, we're gonna take a, one more quick break. And when we return, are there crops that cannot be no-tilled because they require disturbance? Be right back. Today's episode is also brought to you by FarmRaise. Still using QuickBooks for your farm's bookkeeping? You're wasting time and losing money. Farm finances can be overwhelming, but they don't have to be. FarmRaise Tracks is the all-in-one tool built just for farmers. Manage expenses, prep for taxes, run payroll, and plan for the future without spreadsheets or stress. Just clear, organized insights to keep your operation thriving. Thousands of farmers trust Tracks to make smart financial decisions all year long. It's time you did too. Use code NOTILL20. That's all caps, no spaces, no till two zero for 20% off the life of your membership at farmraise.com. All right, back to the show. All right, so when no-till growers was a baby, little baby, it was cute, back in 2018, one of the things we ran into a lot was people, mostly older school growers, who would be like, no-till is impossible because all growing requires some amount of disturbance. Like you have to disturb the soil to plant uh, a lettuce plant or to get tomatoes deep enough into the ground or potatoes, you literally have to dig those up. Therefore, it cannot be no-till. And I still get these comments today, but I think what has to be understood about tillage versus no tillage is that although tillage is a type of disturbance, disturbance is not inherently tillage. So to back up, one of the first things I do when I do public talks on our practices, I almost always start with defining tillage and I do a similar thing in the Living Soil Handbook. But basically tillage is an old, old word that effectively means to prepare the soil for growing crops. Because back in the day, when people were using bone plows or sticks or fire or even horses uh, and iron plows to prepare the soil, they were limited in what they could do. So tillage had a relatively positive connotation, just getting the soil ready to plant. But as machinery came along and tractors replaced animals and steel replaced iron and synthesized nitrogen replaced manure and compost, the ability to really prepare a lot of soil on a wide swath of land changed. Suddenly, what it meant to prepare the soil for growing crops, i.e. large-scale tillage, grew exponentially, which meant exposing uh, more soil to erosion and degradation. So effectively, over time, tillage started to take on a lot of those negative connotations associated with farming fence row to fence row. Erosion, 
uh, pollution, habitat destruction, all those things. Dictionaries are often, uh, you know, notoriously slow to catch up to modern definitions. So although you may not see those negative connotations in the current definitions, you hear them in conversations about tillage. And so for that reason, I often propose a new definition to the effect of tillage is any level of disturbance that causes long-term harm to the soil. In that case, with that definition, what to me does no-till mean? Well, to me, no tillage then refers to practices that not only avoid long-term harm, but also actively promote long-term soil health. So in that way, not all disturbances are tillage because some, you know, disturbances like uh, shoving a living plant in the soil, but also potentially broad forking to decompact the soil and make it more capable of sustaining plant life and microbial life. Those are disturbances that benefit your soil for a long time to come. So yes, uh, you have to dig up a potato or sweet potato or ginger root. But if you are following the other soil health principles, then you should not fret about that disturbance. It's a requisite and it doesn't have to be harmful. Uh, Disturbance, everything from large projects like terracing to small disturbances like using a stick to shove a seed in the ground have been a part of growing food since the beginning of humanity. And for good reason. When done right, we can grow great food and improve our soils at the same time. That's what no-till is all about. It's about growing food in a way that makes it easier to grow food next year and the year after that. All right, I think I'm going to wrap it up there, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on all this. Before we go, a quick word from our friends at Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether you're growing tomatoes for market, flowers in the spring, or vegetables for your family, growing in a high tunnel protected from the weather provides the right environment for a harvest you can count on. Rimmel greenhouses are strong, durable, and easy to assemble, offering the quality you need to grow productively year-round. The team of experts at Rimmel Greenhouse Systems will be your trusted partners to ensure you get exceptional value from your greenhouse or high tunnel investment. Visit Rimmel.com today to get growing. Don't forget that No-Till Growers is now officially a 501c3, so donations are tax-deductible and greatly appreciated. You can find those deets in the show notes. Please make sure to like and subscribe and or follow wherever you're getting this podcast. That's an easy way to help us out. Enormous thank you to all of our show sponsors. And if you'd ever like to sponsor the show, you can reach out to Farmer Michelle at notillgrows.com. Huge shouts to Willie Breeding for the theme music, Mike Hilbert for the production help and editing, and the team at No-Till Growers. Also, shouts to Epidemic Sound for the background music that you can hear. Pick up a copy of the Living Soul Handbook or the Seed Farmer at notillgrowers.com to support our work. Big, big thank you to everyone over at patreon.com slash notillgrowers where at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, or you sign up in the month of April for a few more days, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs today to Mariner. Mariner is our weekend sign up. All right, so um, let's see. This week's novel right, is inspired by Mariner and is the story of a group of growers who, frustrated by their lack of affordable land options, decide to uh, build a garden community right on a lake and farm there. And there's, you know, a fair amount of pushback, uh, you know, from the the local community. But based on their local laws, there is a loophole that suggests this isn't technically illegal. The townspeople aren't happy, uh, but it isn't only the townspeople who take issue with this new venture. Something in the water has a problem with it, too. And that's tomorrow on the Mariner. Thanks for watching and or listening. We will see you then. It'll be great. It'll be Tuesday as well. It's a win-win. <laughs>